Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us on our first pop-up webinar. I'm Molly Brown from the Heartland Telehealth Resource Center. We're glad you're joining us for the first pop-up event to bring you breaking news in federal legislation related to telehealth flexibility. Just a few notes before we get down in, into all the business Rochelle's gonna share with us. This session is being recorded and we will share it with you afterwards as we do, usually do with our webinars. Your microphones have been muted, so please unmute yourself or use the chat to talk. We do have a full house today, so we will be monitoring the chat box. And for any reason, if we do not get to your question, we will be downloading that information and we can at least address it via email uh, following the webinar along with some resource materials that we might share. We will be providing completion certificates and they will be emailed to you following the uh, webinar. It is important to sign on with your first and last name so we can identify you. Please, you can rename yourself in the Zoom by clicking those three dots up in the upper right-hand corner of your Zoom screen. And you can include your full name so we can download the att attendance list. Uh, also to note, we are having weather conditions in the Midwest. Uh, right now, there's a lull in some of the clouds. So hopefully it won't cause any technical issues. If it does, we will log on as soon as possible to uh, resume our recordings and our, our webinar. So let's get started. I'd like to introduce Rochelle Marty. Rochelle is a local attorney who is also a registered health information administrator and certified medical coder. Her practice focuses on medical coding, billing and reimbursement, HIPAA privacy and security, health information management and regulatory compliance. We are so glad to have her here today on this quick pop-up that we scheduled to talk about the telehealth flexibility extensions that were granted last hmm, about 10 days ago. Now I will turn it over to Rochelle. Right, and I'm gonna turn my video on here for just a moment to say hi before I pop it back off since I've got uh, some slow internet speed maybe due to those weather conditions here in the Midwest. Um, this, is, this is really exciting. We had, at, as Molly mentioned, on the 9th of March, uh, some breaking news that, um, that the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2022 had passed the House and very quickly the next day passed the Senate and built into that law were some really important extensions and clarifications on what might happen after the public health emergency ends. And what I think is important Important about well, there's a number of things that are important about this uh, act uh, that includes several extensions to the telehealth flexibilities that we have as a result of the COVID public health emergency. Some of that is beginning to I, I I almost hesitate to say it's signaling what might look like the wind down of the public health emergency status at least with respect to that designation by the Department of Health and Human Services I said that last year in July and then um, uh, then things didn't look good within a month or two so I'm going to cautiously say that that seems to be what might be signaled um, by some of these changes in legislation at the federal level. What this language did in the consolidation Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2022 among the 2000 some pages of statutory changes were some provisions regarding telehealth and the key um, flexibilities that we've been granted during the public health emergency that are extended by this act affect the geographic requirements so that rural area as well as originating sites under the, the social security act those restrictions that we typically have but for the public health emergency some discussion on how those uh, relaxed requirements on geography and originating sites affect originating site fees um, some expansion or extension of the distant site practitioners who could continue to bill for a period of time when the public health emergency ends. It, it discusses FQHCs and RHCs as distant site providers of telehealth services where prior to the public health emergency, they were eligible as originating sites only and not as distant site providers of telehealth. There are some provisions that discuss the coverage of audio only telehealth services 
And if you were on our session last week discussing hospice and palliative care, um, there are provisions about the recertification requirements that typically have to be in person face to face for hospice that are addressed in the consolidation of cons goodness consolidated appropriations act of 2022 also. So at a high level, I want to go through some of the basic provisions, and then we'll get into the details on those that are specific to telehealth and what would be what will be affected by this language. So right now, um, our, our current 90-day cycle of the public health emergency that's declared by the Federal Department of Health and Human Services is set to expire April 16th, 2022. And every 90 days, the Secretary of Health and Human Services can uh, uh, renew, if, if the requirements are met, can renew that for another 90 day period. It could be revoked before it is allowed to expire. Um, but that's our current period uh, was renewed in January that would take us through the, um, April 16th as of right now. Um, I, there, there doesn't seem to be any indication that there are plans to revoke it early prior to April 16th. Uh, I also don't see strong signals that it would be allowed to expire April 16th of 22. So as of the last couple of days, the last week or so, it all signs seem to point to a likely renewal in April uh, in April that would take us through July. Now, a lot can happen as we've seen in different ebbs and flows of the public health emergency where things look good. It looks like the emergency may be winding down and then we get a new, uh, a new variant or a new surge. So at the moment, obviously things can change quickly. Um, there seem to be some signals that July could potentially be uh, a point of focus as to whether the public health emergency would be renewed again at that point. If, and, and again, there's no guarantees that uh, it wouldn't go away April 16th. It just doesn't seem to be pointing to that. But if it did, um, what the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2022 would do was extend many of the flexibilities that we have been granted as a result of the emergency that are not allowed outside of the PHE because they are set by statute or other regulations and would extend a number of those for a minimum of 151 days after the public health emergency ends, whenever that is, whether it's April, July, or later. So if the public health emergency were to expire April 16th um, at the end of the current 90-day period, that 151 days of extended telehealth flexibilities would take us into September if it's renewed one more time and uh, and would be allowed to expire July 15th, that 100, 151 days from that point would take us to the end of the calendar year. And that's an, um, another reason that I think that 1231 uh, date being 151 days after the end of the public health emergency just seems to be a nicely timed date at the end of the calendar year that might be signaling um, some, some significance to the July uh, expiration date of the public health emergency. So now let's get into the specifics on what flexibilities in delivering telehealth are extended through this, this federal statute. Um, and again, because it's been, this is being done as a statute, uh, these are minimums and the, the Department of Health and Human Services could make some modifications on a regulatory basis um, for certain pieces that are within their purview. And I'll kind of highlight as we go through this where there could be regulatory flexibilities to be even more, um, more flexible than these minimums that Congress has set by statute. So the first really important one um, addresses the geographic requirements for telehealth that come from the Social Security Act. And because these are statutory, um, it takes a literal act of Congress like this Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2022 to make these changes have an impact when the public health emergency ends. 
When the public health emergency ends, Health and Human Services as an agency no longer has the authority to put some flexibilities that eliminate the rural geographic area requirements um, and to expand the eligible originating sites. So what we see in this um, extension for 151 days after the public health emergency ends is a temporary revised definition of what an originating site is. And so I put this up here because um, I think for me, it's helpful to kind of picture what this look like, looks like in the actual Social Security Act. And oops, sorry about that. Here at 1834 M4C, there are two parts to that definition currently as to what constitutes an eligible originating site for telehealth and but for the public health emergency flexibilities, these are some pretty significant restrictions that we have to operate under. It has to be in a rural geographic area and there are several subparagraphs defining what it means to be rural. And the, goodness, sorry about that, the place where the patient is physically located has to be among one of a list of several eligible healthcare originating sites, like an FQHC, a provider office. Outside of the public health emergency, for example, the patient's home is not an eligible originating site with very, very, very limited exceptions. So the Consolidated Appropriations Act, this is what that language actually looks like. So we have 4C, this is where originating site is defined, and we have the rural geographic area piece, and then we have the eligible originating sites. And when the public health emergency ends, typically that would mean we would be reverting back to these originating site requirements. However, with this Consolidated Appropriations Act, there is now a third paragraph that says that definition of originating site for 151 days after the public health emergency ends, we're going to wipe out paragraph one, geographic restrictions, we're going to wipe out paragraph two, eligible originating sites, and this is the definition that will apply for 151 days. And it means that any service that is an eligible telehealth service um, can be delivered at an originating site, which will mean um, any place in the United States where the individual is located when the service is furnished using a telecommunication system, including the home of the individual. So I want to highlight a couple of pieces of this. Um, first, telecommunication system is defined by the Department of Health and Human Services as an agency, not in the Social Security Act. So that means, oh, excuse me. That means that uh, right now, or excuse me, prior to the public health emergency, the policy was that that telecommunication system, with very limited exceptions, had to be an audio, visual, real-time, two-way communication. So with, with that in mind, that is something that the agency could modify on a regulatory basis. They are not bound to have an audio-visual two-way, real-time, be the definition of a telecommunication system. So there is a one opportunity for flexibilities that we may see on a regulatory basis outside of the statute and the minimums. The other thing this did is this is actually broader than what we have during the PHE. During the PHE, not only is this rural requirement that we see in 4C, I can get my cursor or my little highlighter to work here. One, where we're talking about only these certain um, rural geographic areas. That doesn't apply. That is waived during the public health emergency. But that ability to waive that by the Department of Health and Human Services goes away when the PHE ends. So we had to have Congress pass this act to continue to waive that for a period of time afterwards. 
but the waiver during the public health emergency that addressed paragraph two down here, the sites said that in addition to all of these sites, we will add uh, the patient's home as an eligible originating site. So it really just added one item to the end. But what this will do for 151 days after is not just add the patient's home, that's added as well, but any other site. So that could be um, a retail clinic. That could be, I don't know, uh, the, the library where the patient's located or other healthcare sites that aren't specifically called out on the list here. So what I like about this definition of originating site is it's actually broader than what we even have during the public health emergency per, for a period of 151 days. With that, I know I'm jumping around a bit, but I'm going to go back two slides here. Our typical originating sites that are in the Social Security Act before the public health emergency came about, this list that you see in 4C Roman numeral two down here on sites described, those are the only types of sites that could bill an originating site fee for a telehealth service. But now we know that any site for 151 days after the public health emergency ends, like a retail clinic, could also be the place where the patient is located and the distant site provider can provide and bill for an, a, a telehealth service. However, any healthcare sites that serve as an originating site as a result of this expanded flexibility, like a retail clinic, they cannot bill originating site fees. The only locations that can bill for originating site fees when the public health emergency ends are those sites that were already called out as eligible originating sites in the Social Security Act before the public health emergency came about. So what that means with respect to, it makes telehealth available outside of rural geographic areas and any place where the patient is located and the distance site provider can bill for those services, but it doesn't necessarily expand who can bill, it doesn't expand who can bill for the originating site fees. So on the other side of the telehealth um, uh, service component, right, we have the originating site where the patient's located, and then we have distant site practitioners. And during the public health emergency, um, distant site practitioners is, it's defined in the Social Security Act, and um, we've got flexibility right now that any healthcare provider that is enrolled and eligible to bill Medicare for services who provides the telehealth service within their scope of practice and the telehealth service is on the telehealth service list, they could bill and be paid for the telehealth service during the public health emergency. With the Consolidated Appropriations Act by statute for 151 days after the public health emergency ends, at a minimum, occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy, and audiology will, will be able to continue to provide telehealth services as distant site professionals. Those four categories, those disciplines are not ordinarily eligible distant site professionals outside of the public health emergency. Okay, so let me go back one step here. This extension then is more limited than what we have during the public health emergency because it's only guaranteeing that these four disciplines in particular can continue to be eligible distance site practitioners for at least 151 days when the PHE ends. But all other professionals who were not eligible distance site practitioners prior to the PHE, their ability to render telehealth under the Medicare program will end 
based on the rules we have right now, the day that the public health emergency ends. FQHCs and RHCs have been a focus of telehealth policy and a lot of the bills that we are seeing uh, to make some of these extended flexibilities permanent uh, discuss FQHCs and RHCs and how they're involved in telehealth. Typically, prior to the PHE, FQHCs and RHCs were only allowed to be involved in telehealth arrangement as an originating site where the patient is located. And during the public health emergency, FQHCs and RHCs were allowed to serve as distant sites and bill for um, telehealth services as the distant site provider. So for example, if a patient is at home and the FQHC or RHC provider rendered a telehealth service during the PHE, that was okay to do that as the distant site provider. But prior to the PHE, that type of arrangement was not allowed for, for several reasons under our, our previous and, and very restrictive Medicare telehealth rules. But FQHCs and RHCs will continue to be allowed to serve as the distant site telehealth provider for 151 days after the public health emergency ends. Rochelle? Yes. We do have a question. Are there any examples of other provider types that would not be extended for the 151 days? Yeah, sure. Um, I would have to pull up my my 855 uh, my 855i Medicare enrollment form to look at all of the different types of disciplines that Medicare specifically enrolls. Um, our physicians, our um, uh, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, clinical nurse specialists, nurse midwives. Uh, CRNAs even, I believe, are all allowed to provide uh, services as distant site practitioners even before the public health emergency. So what I can do is pull up a list of all of the other disciplines and send out with the slides after the session that are not typically on the distant site practitioner list and are not the PTs, OTs, but those who would be affected with an immediate cutoff the day the PHE ends. I think that would be helpful because an, additionally, an additional question would be specific to dietitians um, not being able to provide services after the PHE ends. Sure. So that's a great example. Um, and I, I don't recall off the top of my head they're listed prior to the PHE. I don't think they were. And that's probably why the, que the, the question was in the chat. Um, so if they register with Medicare and they're eligible to register and bill Medicare independently, then as a result of the PHE, they were allowed to provide telehealth where they may not have been prior to. So that would be an example then when the PHE ends, that type of, of credential or professional would be affected with an immediate cutoff and no longer able to render telehealth services. So that's definitely something to be watching for if you have those types of professionals that um, have a newly created ability to render telehealth during the PHE, but aren't PT, OT, speech therapy, or audiology. Whenever we, if, if we get an, an alert or a notice that the PHE is going to be allowed to expire, their schedules for telehealth services may very well extend weeks or months in advance and could potentially expand after that, that date that the PHE ends. And so their schedules and their services would be affected and those would have to either be rescheduled as in-person visits or would not be billable services. Okay, it uh, looks like we have a few more questions popping in. Sure, I think yeah, I'll pause here, this is great. Oh, if you want to, or we can wait till the end. I think we have a few this more is perfect. slides. Let's go ahead and, yeah, let's go ahead and answer the questions we've got. Okay, perfect. When a physician providing telehealth services to a non-Medicare patient, can those services be charged directly to the patient in forms of cash payment outside of the third-party reimbursement? So let me, I'm gonna pull up the chat so I can read the question too. When sure. a physician providing telehealth to a non-Medicare patient. Okay, so there's a lot of details um, that we may need to think about here. If the the patient is not a Medicare patient and a 
provider wants to uh, treat the individual as cash pay, there are a couple things to, to take to keep in mind. If the individual is covered by insurance and if the provider rendering the telehealth service is in network contracted with the patient's insurance, you need to look at the contract because there may be some provisions on when you can and cannot treat the individual as cash pay um, and how you go about that. And it may also depend on whether the service is a covered service under the member's benefit plan or not a covered service under the member's benefit plan. So that's the first thing you want to look at if you are in network with their insurance. The other thing that you want to look at um, or consider is that under HIPAA, there is a provision that a patient has a right to request that you not bill their insurance, even if you are in network with their insurance. And in order, there, there are cert certain circumstances where you may have to agree to that request to treat them as a cash pay patient under the HIPAA regulations. So none of that is affected by um, this new statute that has come out extending the flexibilities for 151 days. But certainly if there are specific scenarios there that we can, we can um, work through and I can provide information on and be happy to do that, the contract and the patient's right to request a restriction would be the two to look at first. And Rochelle, I'd add from a more global perspective because I find that there's often confusion. When we're talking about CMS rules, um, those absolutely apply to Medicare. Um, they do apply to Medicaid in terms of if CMS requires Medicaid to provide it, but remember Medicaid is a state plan and the private insurance of course is different. And so sometimes people get confused and think when we're talking about the CMS rules that those necessarily apply to Medicaid or to private insurance and they don't. For example, Missouri, one of the three states has a telehealth parity law. So you can do lots of things uh, under Missouri Medicaid that you can't do or that we're worried about doing under the CMS policy. So it's important to understand the insurer and so um, don't think you may be able to provide that telehealth service and build the insurance for it, even if it's not a CMS allowed service because the private insurance may allow it. Absolutely. And it's hard even, I, I'm glad you pointed that out. And I'll, I'll emphasize again, everything in the Consolidated Appropriations Act that was passed March uh, 9th and 10th by the House and the Senate, these are affecting the Medicare telehealth rules, those very restrictive requirements that we had prior to the, the public health emergency that were relaxed during the public health emergency, and now extending those for a brief period of time um, when the public health emergency ends to give time for either changes in workflow and operations to revert back to pre-COVID rules, or what I'm hopeful for um, is, is another act of Congress to make some of those permanent rather than just extended after the public health emergency ends. But these are Medicare only rules. You're exactly right. And it will allow in those states that are more restrictive than Medicare um, for telehealth, the change in Medicare rules may require Medicaid to change, but that's something that we'll have to look at very carefully if things pass. But in a lot of states, Medicaid is less restrictive, such as Missouri, such as Oklahoma, unfortunately not Kansas yet, but we're trying. Um, and so you can do more under telehealth in those states than you can under the CMS rules for Medicare. That's kind of the, the most important point is you may be able to do it in Medicaid and you certainly may be able to do it in private insurance, um, even if Medicare isn't allowing it. Absolutely. And even with private, uh, in a private commercial third party insurance carriers, with telehealth in particular, um, it's hard to even say this is the rule for Aetna or Blue Cross or Humana or United because every single member's benefit plan dictates what can and cannot be provided and what modalities. So we can kind of have broad sweeping policies on this is what Blue Cross generally says or Aetna says, but there's always the caveat that it is benefit plan specific. And so it's really hard to have those those guidelines on you, this is what you do in this particular scenario and how whether it's covered, non-covered, uh, and in turn, how that affects whether you can and how you would treat that patient as cash pay. An additional comment to that question in the chat box was, so, sorry, it advanced. So telehealth care after the end of COVID is a, considered a non-covered procedure. 
No, no, not no. Um, for no, not necessarily, and that's that is true for. I, I'm I'm pausing because Medicare will continue to be covered for commercial insurance companies. Most insurance companies will still cover telehealth to a certain extent, but exactly which services are covered via telehealth, which providers can render telehealth as a distant site practitioner, uh, whether it can be audio, audio visual, all of those details are not only payer specific, but benefit plan specific. There may be some insurance companies and there may be plans that continue to cover telehealth exactly like it is today. But to determine whether you can treat a non-Medicare patient as a cash pay patient is really impacted first by your contract with that insurance company if you're in network with them. Second, by the particular service and whether it is considered a covered or non-covered service under that patient's particular benefit plan. Many benefit plans will cover telehealth to an extent, some may not. And so we'll really have to dig into each individual's benefit plan to determine how that works and the mechanism that you would be able to uh, treat that individual as cash pay. Now we move to a question about critical access hospitals. Can you comment on the impact of these extensions to these access hospitals? Um, the comment was that they read that CH, CAH's critical access hospitals will no longer be able to bill Medicare for telehealth services after the PHE ends as they were excluded from the 100, 151 day waiver. That, that's a great question. I'm gonna back up a couple of slides here, I have seen that comment as well. So critical access hospitals, they are, they are eligible originating sites even prior to the public health emergency. So with it, in that sense, their ability to be the originating site for a telehealth service will not change as eligible originating sites. What I think the references that you may have seen about critical access hospitals leave, being left out could refer to is um, whether and under what circumstances a critical access hospital could report telehealth as a distant site provider, similar to the way FQHCs and RHCs were added during the public health emergency as, as able to bill as distant site providers. Um, thinking through that though, um, if, if the, I, I think uh, as I've looked at it, that that primarily affects critical access hospitals that are billing under method one. If it is, and the, that's the 101% of, of, of Medicare and the cost base. If, the, if it's a critical access hospital billing under method two, I don't think those, those um, alerts that you've seen that critical access hospitals were left out will have an impact because under method two, the distant site professional billing for the service is not the CAH, it's the professional and they have reassigned their billing to the hospital. So the critical access hospital is submitting the claim, but it is still the professional that's billing as the distant site provider. So the impact, would, yeah, go ahead, Robert. I was just gonna say, I would add here that I, I've often found the confusion here is also related to the fact that costs tend to own rural health clinics. And so um, they get into that issue of being able to bill and what they can bill because of the rural health clinic rules. Um, and often I get questions that seem to be about cause, but are really about the rural health clinics owned by the cause. Right, and if, if the rural health clinic, um, regardless of its ownership, RHEs and FQHCs will continue to be eligible to serve as the distant site billing providers for telehealth services for 151 days. Um, the only thing I can think of with CAHs in particular are those billing under method one. And I know this gets complex and I would remind everyone that when you have very specific questions, you know, we try to cover what we can in these sessions, but you can always send those very specific questions to us and we'll get them to Rochelle and, uh, you know, get you uh, uh, an answer to the best of our ability. 
So thanks everyone for these nice hard questions. I always like to stump Rochelle as you've heard before. And I, I, even though I don't have my camera on, here we are at 1137 with four slides left. So man, I thought I was gonna get through it quickly today. Um, mental health services via telehealth, remember that even without all of the flexibilities um, during the public health emergency, prior to COVID, there, we still had the Support Act, which made um, telehealth services available for individuals um, being evaluated or treated for substance use disorder or mental and behavioral conditions that co-occurred with substance use disorder. And those were available to individuals at home even before the public health emergency started. That's going to continue. Uh, the end of the PHE, this new Consolidated Appropriations Act does nothing to, to, to lessen the coverage for those support act substance use disorder services via telehealth. Then there was an expanded, the Consolidated Appropriation, Appropriations Act of 2020 created an expanded coverage to make telehealth services for individuals with mental and behavioral health conditions not necessarily co-occurring with a substance use disorder. Also available via telehealth to patients who were at home and who may not be in a rural geographic area. That will continue to be available even without, uh, even after the public health emergency ends. And there are certain circumstances when those mental behavioral telehealth services, not necessarily co-occurring with a substance use disorder, could be rendered via audio only. And there's some requirements we've talked about in, in previous sessions that you can go through and see the documentation requirements on when those could be done as an audio only service. Now the piece of the two pieces of the Consolidated Appropriations Act that made mental behavioral telehealth services available on a permanent basis, even after the PHG, even without any extensions of flexibilities to patients at home and patients outside of rural geographic areas um, were an initial in-person visit requirement, in-person non-telehealth visit requirement before the telehealth services for mental and behavioral conditions began and subsequent in-person visits um, at a frequency that was going to be decided by the Department of Health and Human Services. That was a big sticking point for the behavioral and, and mental and behavioral health community because those requirements don't exist under the Support Act for substance use disorder services. And so the in-person requirement doesn't get triggered until the public health emergency ends. However, this new Consolidated Appropriations Act that was just passed further extends that in-person visit requirement for another 151 days. That includes whether these mental behavioral telehealth services are rendered by um, physicians, nurse practitioners, APRNs, uh, PAs, or if the distant site billing provider is RHCs and FQHCs, that in-person visit requirement will be extended for 151 days after the PHE ends. This is a big one too. I'm always being asked what's happening to the audio only flexibility of telehealth services. This was a really big deal at the end of 2021, December 31st, when in Missouri, the, uh, the emergency declaration that was allowing for audio only telehealth services went away. And it wasn't for another uh, 10 days before we had some clarification from the Missouri agencies on what that meant for audio only services. For Medicare, services that are currently allowed to be rendered as audio only services during the public health emergency and only as a result of the flexibilities from the public health emergency will continue to be covered by Medicare as audio only services for 151 days after the public health emergency ends. 
at that point, the only services that can be delivered as audio only would have to be um, added on a regulatory basis as telehealth services by the Department of Health and Human Services. The good news is it doesn't take an act of Congress to designate certain services as allowed via audio only or services that require audio visual. That's something the agency can do um, on a permanent basis, even after the public health emergency ends. Uh, the Going back a slide again, the mental behavioral telehealth services to patients outside of a rural geographic area, to patients out, uh, who, who may be in their home that would typically require an initiating in-person visit when the public health emergency ends, um, they can be delivered as audio only services even after this 151 day period. As long as all of the audio only requirements are met, that is a permanently available option for that really specific um, uh, narrow scope of services. Then if you joined us last week when we were talking about um, hospice and palliative care, the certification that the patient meets requirements to be on hospice, generally that they've got a terminal illness or condition where um, if the disease were to run its normal course, the patient would typically have a life expectancy of six months or less. That certification um, that, uh, happens at several different points in the hospice episode. There's an initiating certification when the patient's um, initially electing hospice. There's a subsequent benefit period. And then going into the third benefit period, there's a requirement that that certification going into the third benefit period be a face-to-face in-person visit to certify that the patient continues to need hospice care. During the public health emergency, there's clarification that that third benefit period certification that normally has to be face-to-face in-person can be delivered via telehealth. This Consolidated Appropriations Act will extend that flexibility for the third benefit period of hospice to be delivered via telehealth for 151 days after the public health emergency ends. Outside of that, it will revert to being an face-to-face in-person visit requirement unless we solve some sort of regulatory change to that requirement. Now, the first two benefit periods. If you go back to our session from last week, uh, one of the clarifications that we got as a result of the public health emergency um, is that there's nothing in the requirements right now that prevents the certification for benefit period number one and number two under hospice from being delivered at, via telehealth even outside of the public health emergency. So that extension, that restriction only applies to the certification going into the third hospice benefit period. When I send the slides out, um, I will go back and look at the eligible practitioners that are affected by this and um, to the individual that submitted a question about the critical access hospitals. If, you've, if you are a uh, method one critical access hospital builder and have some questions about that, um, definitely submit those to the HTRC email and I can help walk through those questions. The links that I'll send out with the slides have the Consolidated Appro Appropriations Act you want to go, this is over 2,000 pages, so it starts on page 1901, and that's where you'll see the telehealth language, and I've also included a link to the Social Security Act where those telehealth provisions are, so you can see exactly where they're being changed if you want to refer to that statutory language. All right, I'll pause there if we have any more questions. There's a question in the chat that it might be useful to this group to review what will no longer be extended in the Ryan Hate Act. Okay, I, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head, but I can definitely look at that as I send them out the follow-up information. Okay. We have just a few minutes left. Any other 
questions? This is Jason from the University of Kansas Health System. Thank you so much for clarifying or whoever asked the question about the critical access hospital. We had several uh, physicians in our organization bring that up last week when the omnibus was passed and they felt that the critical access hospitals were left out. Um, so thank you so much for going back and, and discussing how that was impacted in Roman numeral II or III. The thing that um, I think is, is very important for me to understand is um, how the, uh, I think what I'm going to have to do is articulate because I had a number of physicians kind of demand that I uh, kind of ask these questions as I'm working with state and federal legislatures around um, maybe the thought or methodology as to why they left critical access uh, hospitals out of this. And your clarification around, or, or maybe thinking around method one versus method two billing was very helpful. Do you think or see um, kind of, I was trying to leave, listen between your, your uh, response. Do you think that they will address it somewhere else? Or do you think that because they didn't address it, they're, they're, they're really thinking the current methodology is, is fine enough? I haven't seen any indication that the critical access hospital method one is likely to be addressed somewhere else. I do see in a lot of the federal bills, um, the provisions and the flexibilities for RHCs and FQHCs uh, being made permanent. I have not seen that same focus on critical access hospitals. And so Robert, I don't know if that kind of goes to your point that some of the confusion is that the critical access hospitals own the RHC or the FQHC. And so they feel they're left out when really, if they're using method two billing, it, they're not left out in a sense that the way that they bill would still be encompassed by some of these extensions and flexibilities and or the bills that are out there that would make those flexibilities actually permanent even after this 151 day period. Uh, the other thing, at, Jason, um... I, I tried to look at, I, I don't know what percentage of critical access hospitals use method one versus method two. Those that I've worked with, I think were almost always method two. Interesting, okay. So I don't know if the sense no. was the just the proportion of, of facilities that were affected. It, it, most of the CAHs may have been covered through the method two billing and the distance site providers being eligible to continue to, to deliver telehealth as they are now. I was just going to say that as we, um, you know, we do the twice a month regularly scheduled uh, meetings, uh, <laughs> webinars, excuse me, and I think it, um, as we look at the schedule, adding one that's very specific and really doing a deep dive into cause um, and bringing in the ownership of rural health clinics, which I know is so closely aligned as we look at telehealth, um, definitely will add that to the list. I think um, that's a very good topic um, because I know there's a lot of confusion um, and often it comes because of the rural health clinic, the method of billing. Um, because if you asked CMS and the response you'd get from the feds is often, cause, our, cause can do telehealth. That would really be what they say because that's, you know, but getting into the specifics of method and the fact that having a rural health clinic and often the providers employed at the rural health clinic and that makes it even more complicated. Um, these are all things we really probably, um, you know, <laughs> need to spend some time on to come up with a very thorough overview, which Rochelle is amazing at doing um, to get at the, the meat and potatoes of uh, cause and health clinics and that whole system uh, and, and really even do maybe some questioning and understanding um, from a call perspective what the questions are so we can make sure we answer those. Because I do think there's a lot of confusion. I'm not saying that people are incorrect. I think they are correct. But um, I think there's also some areas where there's misunderstanding about what a cop can do. And so we want to really clearly clarify and make sure we're providing strong information there. Wonderful. I appreciate both of you. Yeah, there was a good, um, I'll, I was just trying to look for it, Jason, but I'll have to find it after the session. A good research, a resource from AHA on that broke down the different provider types and what flexibilities they had during the public health emergency. And I believe it was analyzing the Consolidated Appropriations Act that was just recently passed and, and how that affected. And, and if I remember correctly, there was this for CAHs, a discussion on billing their outpatient therapy. 
And I think that was kind of the component that they were looking at. So let me dig a little bit further into that piece and see if that's affected by the method one, method two designation, or, or maybe that's if that's the component that they were looking at, if the hospital's billing for the outpatient therapy on the facility side, the therapists are not billing as indi at independent professional claims even though therapists are added as eligible distance site practitioners, I could see how that could be playing into the CAH's um, outpatient therapy services. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you. Absolutely. Are there any other questions for Rochelle? Okay, so I guess we will wrap this up. Uh, as a reminder, we will send out uh, resources and the slides, including the recording of this webinar. I have noted all of the questions in the chat box that I will be sending those off to Rochelle so that she can work on some of the things that she said she would get back to us. As a reminder, as, as part of the HTRC Education Series, we will be hosting our scheduled webinar on March 30th at noon. We will discuss long-term care service delivery and billing. If you have not joined our Education Series or are on that list, you can find the link on our website or by emailing htrc at kumc.edu. And I think with that, I don't see any other questions in the chat box. Okay, thank you for joining us for our first pop-up and um, have a great week and we will get some emails out to you all soon.